It's just wonderful to hear Emer playing the harp. What a gift. I have a very special connection with the harp as Irish people we do and we commemorate the suppression and oppression of harpists in Ireland as well. So it was particularly poignant for Emer to play uh, Turlock O'Carlan, who was one of the great harpists, as you know, that kept the tradition alive and that Irish musicians today are are actually remembering or bringing back that music, you know, um, from the archives. I know that Steve Cooney and Leisha Kelly as well have been involved and lots of other people. And I don't underestimate the power of us actually bringing back the music, the lost music, because what we're commemorating, what AFRI have been so powerful in doing in this commemoration of the Irish famine has really been to recall and to remember the people, the fallen, the people who were lost to us, a whole peasant class of our society who were predominantly Irish speaking, who knew the names of things, the names of places, um, whether it was, you know, Glaundó, Lucca, if you consider it, I often say it to friends who come from abroad, you know, it's, it means the glen of the two lakes. There's something in indigenous language that it's, it's what was lost to us in the loss of language was the loss of, of the names of things. Um, and so, I mean, I was kind of laughing earlier thinking, um, because I was going to try and film this in the um, in my new polytunnel that I'm very proud of because it's my first time having a polytunnel to grow food. And um, I was thinking of the line from, <laughs> from Leonard Cohen's song that he's like, I hope they're keeping some kind of record. And uh, I thought he meant a potato variety because I'm growing a record variety of potato growth record. And um, so there's so much about the names of seeds and varieties that's been brought back that I find it's such a hopeful time that one of the best things that's happening in bringing back this music in recalling the the lost um from the, or the from the great hunger from Ungert the Moor and in bringing back the varieties of seeds that uh the wonderful brown envelope seeds in West Cork and Irish seed savers in West Clare and East Clare and um in mean, the knoll, the herb, herb, um, I think the wild herbs people and wildflowers and all of the different people who are now bringing back the seed varieties that were lost to us. So it's very important to record and document these um, these things that as John, John McGuire was really brilliant there. I mean, he, he for his sins taught me in UCC a uh, hundred years ago um, in sociology. And I suppose what, what what John was saying there about the structure of the society and the things that were wrong, that actually the, 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 the context for the famine. I mean, it wasn't our fault, really, that we starved. It was because we were only growing this one variety of potato. But this was in the 1840s. It was before the 1870s, this, the, the, of the time of the Land League, which my own great grandfather was involved in. He was with Michael Davitt in West Waterford, um, and they fought the last eviction with Michael Davitt. In fact, P.F. Well, she was my great grandfather. So I think that what the Land League was, you know, and Dermot Furter spoke about this recently, saying that Angertha Moore was really the big thing that changed Irish history because then the three F's came through the Land War and the Land League that the free, free sale, fixed fee of tenure, and fair rent. So reminiscent, so, so such um, similarities to what we have been experiencing today in terms of that that insecurity that people feel. So for me, there's this m monumental opportunity uh, through the crisis that we're in with this pandemic at the moment, which, as the Chinese say, is both a danger and an opportunity. This magnificent opportunity for restoration, recovery revitalization, remembering, putting things back together again. And so that we can actually grow food and have the freedom and the sovereignty to grow food in our local place that we wouldn't have been allowed to be in the time when we lost so much, when we were dependent and we were not allowed to grow a wide variety of food. Um, where do you see the issues uh, today, Claire, around monoculture, both in Ireland and elsewhere? 
Well, you see, Rui, what was interesting for me is like I'm really an ordinary Irish woman who just started growing seeds in my back garden. And um, we discovered that, you know, Anita and Tommy Hayes, they had founded Seed Savers back in the early 1990s. As I always say, uh, it was at the height of the Gulf War. What a hopeful thing to do, like in 1991. Um, that if, if they thought the world was ending tomorrow, I'd plant an apple tree today. And that's precisely what they did. And Anita went and and uh, and got a, a PhD that had been done in the 1940s by uh, Dr. Um, Keith Lamb and retraced his steps of his PhD that had been done by Bicycle in the 1940s to try and find all the old orchards around Ireland. Um, so I think that was such a, a, a great thing to do. Um, I, I suppose, and bringing back now, we've got like over 160 different varieties of apple tree that have been restored in Ireland. So where we're at now, I think, is actually at a, at a really key moment where we can push for these kind of things, where investment and policy needs to be um, shifted towards financing these kind of conservation efforts and conservation through use. And so... For me, when I started growing the Irish pea in particular, which is one of the seed varieties that Seed Savers had repatriated from the Vavilov Institute in Russia, that great Russian scientist who is, if you like, it's the lost scientific paramount, paradigm, at least, or it was the, the road not chosen. Um, they went for the scientific yield route instead of what Vavilov was doing because he's regarded as the father of biodiversity and what he was was doing and Anita is a great expert and love has a great love for Vavilov because he he pursued the route of discovering where plants originated from and discovered this, the eight key centers of origin of key crop varieties and Ethiopia was one of them and that's why I became very interested in understanding then what it was about these countries particularly in Africa where there's uh, obviously, a lot of our aid and our involvement with these countries is our solidarity, as, you, as was also spoken about earlier, the wonderful work done by Ireland Aid, um, non-tied aid all the years, and by Troker and Concern and self Help Africa, and all sorts of people who do a lot of work there. But it struck me that it's a very important moment, because when we think of what the Choctaw did for us in the 1840s, it was actually unconditional love. It was compassion. It was aid without expecting anything in return. And one of the things that really struck me in these news reports recently on RTE was that the Navajo and the Hopi were going, why are we getting all of these subscriptions or this money from Ireland? What's with the Irish? They didn't keep record of the fact that we owe them something. They are amazed at the fact that this solidarity has been returned. But when I went to Ethiopia, the one thing that I could not believe was the incredible advancement of Ethiopian science, their understanding of their importance of, um, and the same in Kenya, in, in parts of Kenya, but although the government was much more open to globalizing forces of corporate in, intrusion, if you like, but in Ethiopia, they knew they're a Vavilovian center of origin for coffee, for example, because coffee is endemic to the region and it's an extraordinarily important place for secondary place of evolution for barley, which the local population hugely rely upon because it grows in very degraded soil. And I went into the Ethiopian Biodiversity Institute in Addis Ababa and was just gobsmacked, absolutely amazed at what was like a Swiss vault with 100,000 accessions of seed. And it's a treasure trove. But they understood that at the height of the Wallow Famine, that their seeds would, that would, become, would be blamed, if you like. And yet we know from the great economist, the Nobel Prize winning economist, Amartya Sen, that it's access and entitlement are the main antecedents to famine. And that that's why when Joe spoke about Desmond Tutu earlier, it was so, so important because Desmond Tutu said, Food is not an accident. Food is a result of social and economic and political decisions. And so it's, it is really important that we listen to what the Ethiopian farmers who are scientists, they're there, you see them in the fields. I cannot believe the, um, the knowledge that farmers, that horticulturists and agriculturists all over the world have, and this tremendous ability that plant scientists and botanists have to maintain the diversity in their fields because they know 
they know, and Ethiopia is an uncolonized country, and they hold that very dear to them that they were uncolonized. They know that their seed diversity is the essential buffer for them against famine and against climate change. And so I think that our solidarity with them must be like the unconditional, loving, compassionate gesture of the Choctaw and the Quakers to us at the height of our famine and our hunger that it would be unconditional and that we would listen to what the people would say. Because if we think of the Irish people that died, our ancestors, my ancestors, um, and I've done a lot of historical work on my own family to try and understand how did some of them survive the famine, how, you know, we are, we are and I remember meeting Mary Robinson in, back in the 90s when we first met her and she came to, 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 to the AFRI Peace Conference in Kildare. And she said, you know, at the 100th anniversary of the Irish famine, it was still too soon to commemorate it. It was still too recent for us to recall it. So we are actually, um, and I, I am, I mean, other people are different generations, but we're the fifth generation. And they say it takes that long to actually to be able to recall it. But it's very, very important for us that we understand that we can't let ourselves be caught again in a trap of monoculturalism, of monoculture cropping. Um, we need polycultures. We need a lot of seed sovereignty, hubs of seed sovereignty all over the country and all over the world, because it's not about protectionism and isolationism. It's actually that this coronavirus, which actually the native indigenous people that I'm in touch with, like the Ojibwe tri tribe in Minnesota and the other tribes are saying, this is a spirit with a function. This coronavirus, this is teaching us something. Mother Earth needs to breathe. And we've been saying this for a while. We are actually now feeling the loss of our forests, the loss of the Congo and the Amazon, these are the lungs of our planet. So we're, the, you see, I see the Isaac Index and the GDP and all of that, and it's like, but the earth has a different bank account. So states, GDP, all of these things don't matter if the earth is actually really being destroyed. So it's 2005 since the leading scientists across the planet have warned us that two thirds of the earth's ecosystem were in danger of collapsing. So for me, who's been working on water and energy and seeds and all of these things for many, many years, I, I still believe this is a huge moment, a globalized moment where we are all in the same boat, but we, we have to be really cognizant that it is a moment of restoration and recovery. And when you can't go very far outside, we can't walk, go very far. It's uh, for me, what's helping me and we all have our up days and that bad days or whatever. But what helps me is that it is a journey within more than anything. And we have to dig very deep um, as we grieve the people we're losing now, but as we're commemorating the people we lost before. And we owe it to our ancestors, to Irish, yeah. the Irish ancestors to do that, to do everything we can to ensure we do not get caught in the same place again dependent on just monocultures and and on huge companies and corporations who do not have our best interests at heart all the That was very powerful, Claire. Thank you for that. Um, could you say a little bit more about that whole notion of sovereignty when it comes to the individual and how uh, as individuals and also as smaller communities and in, in local areas, how we can take that power or realize that power? Absolutely. Well, I suppose that I, I, one of the reasons why I had wanted to or was hoping that I could film in my garden or, or whatever, except that the birds are too loud, actually. And um, at the moment, it's not traffic. Thankfully, it's birds. <laughs> there are starlings in my roof. They're very loud. And um, and there is a guy playing hurling outside as well. So um, but I, I think it's actually for me, this is why the power of the seed, it's such a small thing. I, I have a very small urban back garden in Dublin. Um, I think there's huge possibility. It's a, it's actually a very hopeful thing to do to be able to plant a seed. Um, honestly, I'm an amateur gardener. If I can grow things without killing it for 18 years now, then anybody can. Um, anybody can save seeds. And then I was talking to the great Wayne Farnham earlier, who's working on the outreach program with uh, Irish Seed Savers. And uh, he's terrific. And they're doing a great out outreach program. Go on to irishseedsavers.ie in your own time and check it out because we're going to 
you know, really it's possible for us to do things as a community. So it's not just me saving seeds. So I have got seeds ready to share with my friends on Monday when we're all around, allowed to meet again. Um, I share over the wall with my neighbor and with my other neighbors on the other side. And um, even my GP rang me recently and I thought he was doing contact tracing for the coronavirus, but he was actually looking for seed potatoes. And, um, and I luckily still had some and I cycled down with them. So I think that there's something really wonderful about what we're going to be able to do because the back garden gardening is actually hugely, hugely important and has been, it's, cal it's, it's, it's documented that all over the world, it's actually one of the, the, the a key ingredient of, of food security in a lot of places. I mean, we know it from um from cuba we know it from rwanda during the um genocide where there was a potato famine the same year in 1994 that the the huge diversity of bean seeds and a wonderful plant scientist a bean boffin of rwanda at the time saved a lot of the bean varieties so we're seeing this kind of of sovereignty that kind of um the 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 action, small actions, small actions of determining seed sovereignty and keeping it and getting it back into the hands of farmers and gardeners as guardians of seed is hugely important. And it's possible to grow an immense diversity in, in, in a small back garden even. But if we're doing it as um, seed guardians across communities and increasing that, expanding that out, I think then it's going to become a very, very exciting project that will actually have a dual function of not just conservation but actually also food security and that's the that's the central link between food security seed security and seed sovereignty and so i mean actually raj patel the great indian writer is wonderful on the issue of food sovereignty when he says well it's, it's possible to be um food secure in a dictatorship or in a prison but food sovereignty is an entirely different thing and in see in the issue of seed sovereignty is it's about control. It's about power, control, risk, and benefit. That's, that's politics. And so in a way, it's so, so important for us who governs, who governs matters in every single one of our countries. It matters that Bolsonaro is in control in the, in the Amazon, in Brazil at the moment. It's, it's really detrimental to the forest and to all of us. And it matters here too. So I, am, I have to say, I'm really thrilled that for the first time there has been a seed a uh, seed steward, a uh, seed saver, a farmer, a scientist, and a woman, uh, Holly Kearns, elected to Doyle Aaron. So we actually have somebody right in there in the new Doyle for the Social Democrats. I have no party political affiliation, but I think we're going to see more and more wonderful people like that coming forward. And so I'm excited about this younger generation coming up. Look at even Emer Lyon and they're playing the harp, but also speaking out. And we are going to hear from Grania in Offaly and, and Donna as well. These are our citizens. These are the people who are actually forging the future. And I hope that they actually place the, the beauty, actually, of seed sovereignty at the heart of the work as well because we have a lot of people from different cultures here now and boy do they have amazing stories about food and so that's why i don't like the word agri business agri anything it's agriculture so culture keep culture at the heart of our agriculture that's what we really really want because they are inextricably linked and they're inextricably inextricably linked to, to the soul and the remembered soul of the irish people Wow. How, how do we finish up here, Claire? I think um, both myself and everybody else um, watching, uh, the, some of the comments coming in have been phenomenal. And uh, I think we need to get you, um, we need to kind of replace uh, a Leo Varadkar with a Claire O'Grady Walsh. Is anybody with me on that? Uh, can we imagine a state of the nation that actually speaks to the, the global reality from the complexity of ecology to economy to well-being? and the interconnected reality around all of that and um, our personal power, our community power and the global links around that. And so much of what you spoke to there, Claire, really went 100 miles deeper than anything I'm hearing from the political rhetoric. Uh, but but as you said, there are signs of hope out there and it's important that we rally behind them wherever we can find them in whatever political guise they, they may come in. Um, that there is a window of opportunity here that we can seize. Absolutely, Rory. Well, thanks so much. Bye, everybody. <laughs>